and welcome to the Mathematical Institute three-minute thesis competition hosted by the Siam student chapter at the University of Oxford. We've invited 11 PhD students from a wide variety of mathematical backgrounds, from the very applied to the very pure, to compete for four potential prizes. Their goal? To deliver their best research presentation in under three minutes with the aid of a single slide. The winners will be decided by you, the audience, and by our esteemed judges, Professor Marcus de Satoy, Professor Helen Byrne, Professor Samuel Cohen, and Dr. Vicky Neal. For more events hosted by the student chapter, check out our website at siamoxford.com or check out our Instagram and Facebook pages at Oxford Siam SE. And without further ado, let's hear the presentations. Which came first, the butterfly or the hurricane? Many of you will have heard of the butterfly effect of chaos theory. It is a semi-serious claim that a flap of a butterfly's wings can set off a hurricane somewhere halfway around the world. In other words, tiny changes can have huge effects in the long run. It's a poetic way to express a mathematical statement that plays a huge role in many disciplines. In my research, I'm interested in the role it plays in nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the process that makes a star shine in the night sky. It is a virtually limitless source of energy, which, if harnessed, could replace coal and gas in our race against climate change. For decades now, scientists have found a way to recreate this process on Earth, but they are still not able to um, keep the necessary reactions going for a time long enough to get more energy than we put in. To understand why, they run detailed computer simulations of the underlying dynamics. But the physics involved is so complex that even supercomputers take months to get um, just a couple of seconds of simulation. And to make matters worse, the equations that describe these um, dynamics are chaotic. From a practical viewpoint, this means that tiny numerical error will amplify as the computer carries out its computations. However, this is not the end of the story. We know that a butterfly flapping its wings usually does not have any effect on the weather. Quite the opposite, the much larger Earth's winds bring the butterfly's contribution into the formation of a hurricane. Something similar happens in fusion too. As it turns out, there is a limit in the amount of free energy that is available to the system. Because of this, there exists an abstract shape around which solutions tend to evolve. This effect, together with the accumulation of errors, makes chaos more like a statement of good mixing, guaranteeing that these solutions will give out the same statistics on average. Ultimately, scientists are more interested in those statistics than the simulations themselves. For example, they want to know what is the average amount of energy produced, or how much energy gets out of a reactor. In my research, we use this simple fact to turn the issue of chaos into an advantage. We have developed techniques that allow us to purposely control how tiny numerical errors increase so as to obtain many different solutions to then average out into the required statistics. At the same time, we speed up computations, utilizing many computers together at the same time. In conclusion, we hope that these techniques can be used by nuclear physicists at the Callum Center for Fusion Energy to get one step closer to solve one of the world's greatest challenges. Thank you. Okay, so I'm working on modeling blood flow through microvasculature within tumors as flows through networks based on the vascular geometry and topology. Now, more specifically, I'm trying to find solutions to the steady state blood flows for these networks. Now, for my work, I made the simplifying assumption of only working with networks for which the interior nodes have a degree of three and the boundary nodes have a degree of one. Uh, and this means we can build up our networks with the two sub networks you can see on the right of the slide. And that is of a convergence unit, which we have two inflows and one outflow, and a bifurcation unit, which we have one inflow, two outflows. Now, the variables you can see on here are the, in blue, you have the pressure variables, which dictates the direction of flow within the network, and the hematocrit, which is essentially the ratio of the red blood cells to the rest of the blood. Now, we can use these uh, kind of sub-networks to build up a network of any size, so long as it follows the simplifying assumptions. Now, the important property of the equation I'm working on is that the solutions conserve the uh, blood at every node, and they conserve the number of red blood cells passing at every node. 
And secondly, that the flow is dependent on the number of red blood cells and the number of red blood cells is dependent on the flow. And so the whole system is coupled. Now, I've um, very perfectly kind of left out why am I doing this and what's important about this. So I'm trying to uh, find the solutions to these equations to study the phenomena of cycling hypoxia within cancerous tumours. And this is the short term fluctuations between normal levels of oxygen and less than normal levels of oxygen in the tumour microenvironment. Uh, because this can be incredibly detrimental to cancer patients. So cycling hypoxia can make cancers more aggressive and can make them more resistant to treatments. Uh, and what I'm seeing for small networks is hysteresis can form for certain choice of parameters. Uh, for instance, the network at the bottom of the slide, um, this plot here shows that for the hematocrit of one of the centre vessels, the, um, this indicates that for some length ratios, there can either be uh, no blood cells present or there could be 10% of the blood is red blood cells. Uh, and I believe the same principle applies for larger, more realistic uh, network examples. And one possible explanation as to why certain regions of a tumour are not always nomoxic is when you have multiple solutions to these equations, uh, some of these solutions can correspond uh, to parts of the tumour being nomoxic, and for other solutions, these same regions could become hypoxic. Um, now, the hope is that if we can better understand why this is the case and better understand which networks give rise to this property, uh, we can hopefully help um, find treatments which alleviate the symptoms of cancer. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Oliver Bond and I'm doing a DFIL research project um, through the INFOM CBT programme with Tokamak Energy. Uh, my research project is about the behaviour of liquid metal inside a type of nuclear fusion reactor known as a Tokamak. It's designed to recreate the conditions of nuclear fusion, a reaction that happens inside the core of the sun. Inside these metal coils, inside ST40, a device that Tokamak Energy have built, a large electrical current and, in, and those coils generate um, large magnetic fields which trap this sea of charged particles otherwise known as a plasma. So when ST40 is switched on um, it can reach temperatures of around 15 million degrees Celsius but Tokamak Energy are aiming to reach 100 million degrees. So at the bottom of the ST40 is a component called the diverter which is where all the excess heat and material goes. It needs to be able to withstand heat loads much greater than those of a space shuttle upon re-entry. Unfortunately, pure solid metal diverters are very prone to damage from the heat, and it's not viable to replace them every few months or years. So trying to carry away the high heat loads from the fusion reaction, almost like a conveyor belt, a thin layer of a liquid metal known as lithium is passed on top of it, and that's been found to improve tokamak performance in virtually all aspects. However, there is one big engineering challenge, and this is to ascertain whether there is a best design for the diverter plate, which allows this heat conveyor belt to function in such a way that the diverter doesn't become damaged as a result of the liquid evaporating. Several ideas we consider by tokamak energy for example, liquid metal flowing down between trenches or between and across posts. Both these ideas exploit a phenomenon known as the Seebeck effect, and the result of that is a temperature increase going from bottom to top, plus a magnetic field going across the post or trenches, results in a force which pushes the fluid down the trenches at a faster rate than gravity. So the goal of my research is to consider simplified versions of these setups and gradually build up and solve mathematical models to gain an intuition for what's going on. So using both computational and analytical methods, we want to understand the fluid, magnetic field and temperature, and also find out whether there is a best shape and what effect the heat has on this surface on the top. If we can crack this, it can have vast ramifications for tokamak design all over the world, taking us one step closer to a clean energy source at such a critical time. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's a graph determined by its strict induced subgraphs. 
So an example of a graph is the wine glass graph in the middle of this slide. So we call these dots vertices and these lines here edges. Um, and if we now remove one vertex at a time, for example, this one, we, we get the triangle above here. And if we remove a vertex over here, we, we get one of these two graphs for, for both of these sort of top vertices. We are left with these four cards, which we then call the deck of cards. And as you can see, these are unlabeled and we allow multiples. Now the question is, is this wine glass the unique graph which has this uh, deck of cards? It was conjectured in 1942 that uh, for every graph on at least three vertices, the graph is indeed determined by a deck of cards. So it's the um, so we say that the graph is reconstructable if it's the only uh, graph up to isomorphism with this deck. So you might expect that if you just have a couple of these cards, you can find some sort of unique pattern in it and sort of glue them together to, to get the graph. And this intuition is correct for almost all of the graphs, but not quite for all. So if we look at the right-hand picture here, we see the graph on the top and the graph on the bottom. And if we remove, say, one of these two things of the square, then it becomes a triangle. So it actually is the case that if we look at the disjoint union of a, of a square, a triangle and an edge, then both for the bottom and the top graph, they have at least six cards which correspond to this middle card. And in fact, you can show generalize this to show that you might need a, to see at least two thirds of the cards in order to reconstruct just a number of edges of the graph, because this top and this bottom graph, they have a different number of edges. So one way to make this problem of the graph reconstruction easier is instead of trying to reconstruct the whole graph, which are, we are still not able to do, just reconstruct a bit of information, for example, the number of edges or the degree sequence. And we can also assume some structure on the graph. For example, we can assume that it doesn't have any sort of cycles like this, it's a tree. And then for the trees, it's possible to reconstruct, but even for other easy graph classes, for example, planar graphs, which are the maps of the world, we're unable to reconstruct the graph. So what I do in my thesis, I do look at sort of these easier scenarios, but then I do make the problem harder again by assuming that less information is given. So instead of assuming all the cards are given like here, maybe we only see three out of four cards, etc. And then we wonder how many cards do we need to reconstruct the graph. And the second scenario I look at is what if the cards become smaller? So one of our results shows that you can still reconstruct trees even if you see only half of the subgraphs, even if you remove half of the vertices at the time, or well, not for half, but for a constant fraction. And this is this is tied up to a constant. So um, what I really like are these, these kind of nice questions, but also the, the really nice techniques. And uh, we have to get very creative in Sorry, time's how up. we... Okay, so um, imagine you're standing on a hilly landscape and you want to find a nice, stable place to sit. One way to do this, which perhaps is not the safest, is to go down the hill at every point in the steepest direction that you see. Eventually, if you find a spot where you can't go down anymore, you'll settle down and this process stops. In general, we can use the same idea called a gradient flow to find local minima functions. So this gradient flow here just says, move a point x in the direction which reduces a function e the fastest. Um, and this idea is a quite a robust way of finding critical points used in things like optimizing nonlinear functions or in solving partial differential equations. Uh, despite this, there can actually be some drawbacks. So one question which I'm interested in it is, for example, whether a given initial state our gradient flow actually settles down to some unique stationary state. So it turns out that this doesn't actually always have to happen, uh, as illustrated by this picture of spiraling tracks going down a hill. Eventually, you'll find yourself on this depressed track le leading in a circle down to the bottom of the hill where you approach a flat circular basin, although you'll never quite reach it and you'll never stop. So you're out of luck in your quest to find a nice place to sit since you might actually travel an infinite distance before you get there. Uh, my work deals with these questions in the world of geometric analysis. So instead of describing the height of a hill, we look at functions which are defined, for example, on surfaces. So you can think of the surface area. Um, in this setting, the critical points are objects called minimal surfaces. And these are something who, these are objects whose structure mathematicians have wanted to understand for a long time, over 200 years. 
Um, so the resulting gradient flow turns out to be some very complicated nonlinear partial differential equation, which I'm not going to write down here, but whose behavior we in general want to understand. And so we can ask ourselves the same question. Uh, all else going well, do we expect our gradient flow to settle down to a nice, unique stationary state? Uh, so to do this, we often do something uh, which takes inspiration from the finite dimensional case, which are to employ something like the Voiceevich inequality, which is uh, an inequality valid for real analytic functions. So it turns out that this inequality is very useful because it tells you that your your gradient flow of this function e will actually settle down to this unique stationary state. It'll travel only a finite distance. Uh, one problem is that when we're dealing with partial differential equations um, and um, geometric flows, uh, like like um, I described before is that we might deal with singularities where most of our techniques for finding, uh, for proving these voice savage inequalities and concluding convergence fail. So for example, we can have this kind of change in topological type. Despite this, we've been able to develop new techniques to use in these situations to find a nice place for our gradient flows to rest their legs. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm working on understanding the rational points on a curve in sort of an algorithmic or computable way. So for context, you should think of a curve as a polynomial C, which uh, is in two variables with rational coefficients. And you should think of this J as a family of polynomials such that the solutions to C embed naturally into J. In particular, J is really simple so that like the real solutions to this family uh, look like a high dimensional torus and the rational solutions of this family look like a lattice inside of this big torus and the path cut out by the real solutions to our original polynomial winds a weird path in this bigger space. Our heuristic is that this weird path um, should not interact with the lattice structure and so the intersection between the red and blue components should be finite and then the rational points for original curve live inside this intersection and will also be finite. However, this is immediately hopeless because the topology on R is too flexible. We can fix this by moving to the p-addicts, which have a more exotic topology. Now, this whole picture uh, requires the rank of this lattice to be less than the rank of the ambient space, and that's not generally true. However, this is sort of an artificial limitation, and it comes from J being extremely simple. J is essentially built from abelianized information coming from C, and we can produce similar spaces using less abelian and uh, less abelianized information. In particular, the purple ambient space becomes uh, what I call S local and the lattice becomes S global. And this rank and dimension inequality um, turns into uh, an appropriate inequality. However, this isn't so important. What is important is that we really change fundamentally uh, the problem we're trying to solve, which is can be phrased as producing functions on the purple space which are non-zero when we restrict them to the red space. In this setting, as I phrased it, this is actually a very difficult task. However, a very similar task um, has been recently successfully solved in the setting of derived symplectic geometry. To get access to these results, we rephrase everything in terms of derived algebraic geometry, which also includes modifying our uh, information in an appropriate manner, which is a bit similar to going from a circle to a cylinder. Uh, then, once we're in the setting of dry symplectic geometry, this initial task of producing functions on the right-hand side turns into checking that two Lagrangian conditions are satisfied. Now, our upshot is that these Lagrangian conditions are generally much easier to check, and they also seem to hold gener uh, for more general uh, C, like C can be a polynomial multiple variables. As a new intersection between fields, this provides the setting of new invariants, and also, this is something you can put into a computer. All right. In January 1967, the great French mathematician André Vey received a letter. It contained radical new ideas from a young associate professor named Robert Langlands, pictured here. He wrote, if you are willing to read my letter, as pure speculation, I would appreciate it. If not, I'm sure you have a wastebasket handy. Luckily, they did not discard the letter. 
and what would later be called by some a grand unified theory for mathematics was born. Its name, the Langlands Program. The Langlands Program aims to connect the theory of numbers with the theory of symmetry. In biology, just a few genetic bases, A, C, G and T, make up the DNA of all life on Earth. Similarly, the genetic code of numbers is expressed in primes, numbers that only divide by themselves or one. Their complex interactions mean that numbers can be just as wild as the natural world. In contrast, the theory of symmetry starts with only a few simple rules, a little like Newton's laws in physics. It produces beautiful, regular structures, like snowflakes. Langlands believed that he could connect the two. But how? Well, so my research focuses on prime clocks. A prime clock is a clock with, instead of 12 hours, a prime number of hours, like three. Then divide each hour into three minutes, each minute into three seconds, here in yellow and in blue, and so on creating an unlimited number of times. Now, you know how to add times on a 12 hour clock. Nine o'clock plus five hours is 14. So that's two o'clock because we took away 12 when we went once around. This is called clock arithmetic and it works the same on our prime clock. We just take away three hours each time we go once around. Being able to add the times gives the prime clock special ways to study symmetry. This means the clock links a prime gene on the left to special symmetry and patterns on the right. I've researched 3D versions of the clocks and shown that symmetry described by a finite amount of data behaves differently to the 2D versions for any prime gene. And that's my tiny contribution to the program. So, is the Langlands program a grand unified theory? Well, not yet, it is still ongoing, but it certainly doesn't belong in the waste paper basket. Thank you. Okay, so how much do you think information was? Okay, well, in many situations, you need to make decision and most of the time you would think you try to make the best decision as you can. But in situation, your decision not just affect from what you receive, but it also affect the amount of information that you get as well. So this inspired basic mathematical problem called the multi arm bandit problem. This problem basically just take you to the casino. You have some slot machine that you try to play. You try to choose which slot machine is the best, but you don't know which one is the best. The only way you know is you need to play it. When you play slot machine, you would gain more information about that machine. So you need to decide whether you're going to play more to gain more information or decide on the best machine. So the question is what happened if the information of one machine could tell you about the other machine? So suppose this question in the real world. You open the department store, you have some product, that you want the price. So you know that if you set the price too high, the demand gonna be low. But if you set the, uh, the price low, the demand would be high. You need to balance between the demand and the price, but the only way you can know about the demand is to place the price. And also different price give you different information about the demand. And so how could you quantify this sort of the amount of information and make decision based on this situation? So my research concerned this topic, and so I basically just concerned on stochastic analysis, write down as of the total reward that you try to get. We then apply some approximation technique and convex analysis. And what we can show is that basically when you make decision, you quantify the amount of thing you obtain, the reward that you get based on two components. The first component is equal to the reward that you receive today. And the second component equal to the amount of information that you learn. And this information corresponds to just the value of information that affect your future reward. And so you not take too much into account of the information that not going to give you for the future. 
we basically use this result and run the simulation against the uh, the goal that basically know what the true demand is. And this plot on your left basically shows the difference when you take into account information and not take into account information. The lower, the better. And this is over 1,000 simulation. And you see that a big improvement on when you take information into account. And so you know how much you should about your information. Thank you. In the next three minutes, time is going to move forwards. But what do we mean by time moving forwards? I'm going to explain the direction of time in three ways using these three example eggs on the slide. Why is it that we see eggs becoming scrambled over time, but we never see the reverse process? Example number one is the most common explanation. A yolk and a white is in a very highly ordered state because there's only a few ways that the egg particles can be arranged to be a yolk and a white. But there's lots more ways that the egg particles can be arranged for the egg to be scrambled and mixed. So it's much more likely that the egg will end up mixed and disordered than that it will end up as a yolk and a white. Now, more generally, the amount of disorder in any isolated system is very unlikely to decrease over time. But this arrow of time is an approximation. It only tells us what will probably happen. And it doesn't work for small scales like quantum systems. So let's move on to example number two. How do we turn an egg from a yolk and a white to being mixed? Well, we could use a whisk and we can use this whisk over and over again. So the whisk is a catalyst for mixing eggs. But there is no catalyst for unmixing eggs. This kind of irreversibility where there is a catalyst for one transformation, but no catalyst for the reverse, doesn't depend on probabilities. But can it be used to describe small quantum systems? This brings me to example three. I am researching whether there exist quantum whisks for mixing quantum eggs. These quantum eggs are qubits, which are the smallest unit of quantum information. Now, a qubit can be in a rare, undisturbed, pure state, which is like the yolk and white, or it can be in the common, noisy, mixed state, which is like a mixed egg. Now, I've shown that there is a catalyst for turning pure qubits to mixed qubits, but there is not necessarily a catalyst for turning mixed qubits back to pure ones. This irreversibility does not use probabilities and it works for the quantum scale. So it hints that the direction of time may not be an approximation after all. But there is another profound implication of this new quantum irreversibility. It suggests that creating pure qubits is harder than was previously thought. But quantum technologies need loads of pure qubits to work. So my research could help us optimize future technology from quantum computers to um, for quantum computers to programmable nanomachines. So traditional medicine has failed to find uh, treatments for a number of degenerative diseases. Regenerative medicine, however, uses stem cells to repair damaged tissue, and this could offer the answer. Stem cell therapies have existed for leukemia since 1975, and there's research undergoing into using stem cells to treat heart disease, Parkinson's disease, and osteoarthritis. Cumulatively, cumulatively, these three diseases affect over 16 million people in the UK. The precise challenge of stem cell therapy is to deliver the stem cells to a, a small target region in the body. One proposed solution is to use magnetic nanoparticles implanted in the cells when then the cells can be guided to the target using external magnetic fields. Biological experiments have demonstrated that there is a vast potential of this therapy. 
However, they've also highlighted some safety and efficacy challenges, which we would like to address using mathematical modeling. The first challenge is, how do you pick the correct magnet? What's the best magnet to deliver as many stem cells as possible? The second challenge is, how do we know what red blood cells are going to do to this process, as we will be delivering the cells in the blood? Thirdly, we need to identify a safe parameter regime where we deliver the stem cells to the target, but not in such large numbers that they aggregate and block the vessels. To address this, we've created a mathematical model for the delivery of stem cells using magnets. We've mimicked the geometry of our experimental collaborators considering a single vessel with, a, uh, with an external magnet. The stem cells travel in the blood, which has a varying viscosity to affect the, reflect the amount of red blood cells in the system. They then experience a magnetic force and form a solid aggregate on the vessel wall. Numerical simulations have allowed us to explain the trends in biological data, as well as identify that the crucial balance for safety is to balance the arrival of stem cells at the target site with the speed which cells leave the vessel and head towards the injury site, thus minimizing aggregation in the vessels. In future work, we'd like to use asymptotic analysis to, to identify the optimal parameter regime for a safe and effective delivery. The flexibility which this modeling has allowed us to look at effects which are not possible without animal experiments. Thus, we hope that our modeling has allowed for a more optimized design of the therapy and to allow this potentially beneficial therapy to reach clinical testing stages faster. Thank you.